You go for a run, you have to trust that person. I was in a good shape when I got to Rio. Everything literally went perfectly. And then we got disqualified because of a technical error. 2020 Summer Olympic Games will be postponed until summer 2021. We realized that we were going to Tokyo the day we got our second negative COVID test back. It's two days before you need to travel and you're still uncertain whether you are going. You need to start and make your own life a success. Nobody's going to do it for you. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed. Intelligent medical aid for professionals. It's a serious sport. It's a very deadly and harmful sport. Brutal sport. Beautiful, which is such a contradiction. But the truth of it is, you play soccer, you play basketball, and you can play tennis, but you, you, you don't play boxing. Well, I always wanted to learn how to fight. I think every amateur boxes amateur with the dreams of becoming professional. When I have a fight coming up, all I think about is the fight. It's literally if we're in a boat, I'm paddling as hard as I can and he's steering. I wanted to fight for a world title, so I'm going to push her as hard as she can go, and it's either sink or swim. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed, intelligent medical aid for professionals. In 1992, I was involved in an accident that resulted in my legs being amputated. I was 25 years old on the day of the accident. I got an amputation of my right leg. I spent probably a year in Baraguana just having the initial surgeries done, so that gave me a lot of time to think about what I was going to do. Mike teaches me how to deal with everything. He's like a mentor to me. The decision to be involved and to make sure that kids who were in the situation I am in have the kind of opportunities that I did became kind of a calling at that point. When I went for my first international competition, I realized that I can actually achieve this. He broke the world record in his class. I want to show people what parasports can be. It's about being strong in yourself so that you know that you can do things. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed, intelligent medical aid for professionals. You know, I used to go to these provincial trials back in the East Rand, and I almost had the sense that I was better than a lot of the bowlers there, but I would always make it to the last round, and coaches would say I'm different, but they never really explained how different I was. The people that wanted to change his action just wanted to change it because it wasn't normal. I'll probably never make it because of my action. Um, there's too much wrong with me. And the fact that he, uh, he was unique in that he jumped off the wrong foot and sort of just set, set his career going on the, on the right foot or maybe the wrong foot. All I really wanted was an opportunity to show people what I can do. The experience and learning will come after that. My biggest objective was to just make a name for myself and show the raw talent that I have. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed, intelligent medical aid for professionals. It's unreal. Every time I have a client for me to get out of the way, it's like I have a six-year-old IT with this great dream to play for the blue bullet. Players like Ruan, he had the mind of a mature test player. He just wanted to learn, he just wanted to grow, he just wanted to buy into what you were saying. Coach Russell, he wants you not just a better rugby player, but also a better person in your life. One of the things that I try to teach the players is that when things are going really, really tough, it doesn't matter what people say to you or how they try and motivate you. What's going to come to the surface is how hard you've worked and how hard you've prepared. The final in the Sharks was a really tough final. They took a full and high game that next one's can't do again at me. That's going to surface and that's going to take them either to the win or if they're going to lose. You must every day grow and and better be as what you yesterday is. You must be a warrior. The only thing to do at a time like this is to try and weigh everything in a kind of mental scale. The World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus outbreak as a global pandemic. The means of preventing it, immunization. 
Randy was the first child to receive an injection of salt polio vaccine in the field trials in 1954. Seeking to pull back the veil from the unknown in order to save more lives. This is the prescription which common sense and medical science recommend. To understand how COVID-19 vaccines work, we need to first look at our own immune systems because vaccines harness what our bodies naturally do to protect ourselves from viruses. When germs such as the virus that causes COVID-19 invade our bodies, they attack and multiply. We typically call this invasion an infection, which leads to an illness. Think of your immune system as a sophisticated organization made up of different types of white blood cells called macrophages, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. At the front line are our macrophages, white blood cells that swallow up and digest germs, but they leave behind parts of the invading germs called antigens so that our body can recognize the dangerous germs and create antibodies to attack them. This is done by our B lymphocytes, the white blood cells that attack the pieces of the virus left behind by the macrophages. Defeating a self-multiplying virus takes a few weeks though, and this is the reason why many people will suffer COVID-19 symptoms before the B lymphocytes manage to find and completely eradicate the virus. After COVID-19 is defeated, a few T lymphocytes hang around as guards, ready to jump into action if the body ever encounters COVID-19 again. And this time, the body doesn't need to work out what to do to fight this particular virus because it already knows. The COVID-19 vaccine is a way to trigger our immune system to get its defenses ready without a single COVID-19 germ ever making it past the gate. It's possible to introduce our immune systems to the protein spikes that encase the COVID-19 germ because everything is made up of DNA, which can be replicated. The only difference between the vaccines is how they're delivered. Both the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines are vector vaccines, which use a double strand of DNA, adding the gene for the coronavirus spike protein to another mild virus that typically causes colds or flu-like symptoms. This virus has been modified though, so that it can't replicate inside the human body or cause illness. mRNA vaccines like the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines also deliver the blueprints of the COVID-19 spike protein to our cells, but the delivery method is different. These vaccines use mRNA or messenger RNA, which is basically a template to build proteins. Finally, there's protein subunit vaccines, which include harmless protein pieces of the virus that cause COVID-19 instead of the entire virus. We can all play our part in defeating this virus. Viruses need hosts. They survive by moving from person to person. With the right soldiers in place to meet them at the door, coronavirus will have nowhere left to go and herd immunity will have been achieved. Is a complete health examination and we mean complete. I am Dr. Erwin Lingenfelder and this is my story. GP. Avid adventure biker, passionate about Vespers, father, husband, friend. We are all the sum of our parts, and that includes our tragedies. For Dr. Erwin Lingenfelder, the 5th of October 2020 was just another day, until it wasn't. It felt as if a giant hand had come up from the earth and grabbed my Vespa. And frankly, that was the last thing I remembered. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Lingenfelder. Your husband's injuries are extensive. He has suffered a subdural hematoma, a fractured right shoulder, eight fractured ribs with bleeding in his chest. His right lung is compressed. He has a small tear in his liver, fractured thorax, and lower lumbar vertebra, and a bruised kidney and spleen. Dr. Lingenfelder's injuries were devastating, and when he awoke with memory loss, unable to walk and unsure what the road to recovery looked like.
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today at ProfMed Roadshow 2022. We're joined by the team today who are going to talk to us about ProfMed 2023 and beyond. We also get to meet a host of interesting thought leaders, including Luzan and Klaus, who are the stars of our Mind and Field documentary series. Those of you who are watching today live on YouTube, you have the ability to comment in the comment section below. Send us your questions and we'll be able to tackle them in our session later with Hendrik and Craig as we come to you to answer anything that you may have on your mind. To get us started and kicked off today, I sat down with John Sanai, a futurist who is also a digital and professional nomad and how he is able to build a life living between Cape Town and the UAE. Let's take a look. John Sanai, you have a fantastic title, sir. Future strategist, which combines human psychology and futurism. Absolutely love that. Because every day feels like we're having to be fortune tellers to see what the next day has in store for us in this crazy world that is 2022. Welcome. Thank you so much. And just a little bit of a caveat. The world's about to get a lot stranger. Oh, no. And, uh, no, yeah. John. We can't, we can't handle more strange. <laughs> well, the, the truth is it, is it is going to become stranger. And that's why I bring in human psychology, because it's our perception of change that we really have to work on, because we've been addicted to certainty for so long, and we don't have the luxury of certainty anymore. So understanding how to actually perceive and act in a world of unknown and uncertainty becomes a superpower. And now we, we, are, we are structured beings. We are habitual. And now you're telling me it's going to get even worse. So that, uh, that well, terrifies me. I think we need to look at it more optimistically. But I think we also suffer from something called fragile optimism, which is if things work out like I want them to be, I'll be optimistic. But actually what we should be working on is something called agile optimism, which gives us the opportunity to be optimistic about the behavior of change which is a very different type of optimism. So we have to evolve ourselves, to be honest. And that evolution of the mindset, it's absolutely critical. So what I'm interested in, I want to start off today, I want to talk about the professional nomad. Right. You, sir, you're a professional nomad, yes. jumping on flights between South Africa and the UAE on a constant basis, yes. operating at rand level one day, dollar level the next. And I'm most interested in how you've just taken the leap and said, listen, I want to elevate myself to this professional nomad status. I want to be able to work, operate and function at a pan global level. You know, I saw a trend about seven or eight years ago called a workation this ability to be on a vacation and work. And I started telling a few people about it and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, that's never gonna happen. And then I read Tim Ferriss's book, you know, The Four Hour Work Week. And then I started to realize that there's certain people out there that are living this sort of life. And it took me a couple of years to prepare, like sell my car, sell my house, sell everything, get rid of all my sort of physical assets, and then begin the process of really just focusing on freedom as a priority. And that's really quite a mindset because, you know, when we grow up, especially growing up in Johannesburg, your success is determined by your car, your watch, your house, your business, right? And the minute you take those out of your sort of characteristic, then you've got to ask yourself, who are you? Because now to become a digital nomad, you have to measure success in a different way. And so that was the first sort of mindset that I had to get through. But today, you know, with a lot of courage, uh, a lot of nervousness, a lot of sleepless nights, um, moving to a new country, moving to a new city, not understanding how the banking works, not understanding how the visas work, not understanding how people's cultures work. And that takes a leap of faith. But, uh, you know, a few years down the line, and I'm absolutely loving it. You speak about Tim Ferriss, and I think he has this great quote, your net worth is your network. Absolutely. And ultimately, off the back of that, for me, most of the people tuning in today are involved in a very soft touch world. Right. A lot of one-on-one -on -one communication, a lot of humans, a lot of support, a lot of trust. So how do you extract yourself from your network and go and recreate one on the other side of the world. With great difficulty, Mike. <laughs> with great difficulty because you're almost arriving there with nothing. Nobody even knows who you are and you're knocking on doors and people are almost like shooing you away, you know? I'm sure you remember when you started your business, people were like, who are you? Get out of here, you know? And it's almost the same, but with a little bit more gravitas because now you have a website, you have a, a sort of list of books behind your name and those sort of things. So it's it's a little bit easier, but really the whole point of going into a new country is you have to get let go of the identity that you've created in one country to now redesign a new identity. But let's not forget the power of social media. Mm. You know, social media gives us this ability to build trust 
in the airwaves. And I've been doing that for many, many years now and been making videos. I think I've got 350 videos on YouTube now that I've been storing and obviously my five books and being linked to certain universities have given me a certain level of gravitas. So there's a process to take to build trust on a global level that I've been practicing without even knowing that I was going to become a digital nomad, but it's put me to good stead. And I think to that point, I think thought leadership is more important now than ever. So many of us tuning in today, like we're used to that in-person relationship, but COVID gave us the situation where we could open doors. We are always one or two degrees of separation from pretty much anybody in the world because of the LinkedIn's, because of the Facebooks of the world. So if we start putting ourselves out there more, we'll start being able to attract those individuals virtually. And then being able to convert that at the physical level is still a super important part of that trust and that network. What do you you reckon? Absolutely. But I think we also have to realize that most people are quite shy or nervous to give away all their information. They think, well, if I give all my information away, what's going to happen to me? What's my service going to be? But the truth is, is that people can't implement many of the things you speak about until you're with them. You know, we all watch so many different YouTubes and so many different talks, but we hardly implement any of them until we actually go in and physically work in a workshop or practice certain things. So I think we also have to realize marketing has changed. It used to be, here's a little bit of what I do, sign up for my course and then you can come learn all of it. Whereas today it's become, here's everything I do, let's engage that I can give you even more. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be quite generous and optimistic in the way we share our information. And that's never been a scare for me. You know, I've openly share everything that I research, write about, and put it out there. And I think this has really helped me develop trust with speaking agents and organizations in the Middle East that have made it easier for me and more of a softer landing there. I think that's such an important comment about IP. Once again, you used a Johannesburg analogy. We used to living behind large walls mm. with electric fences and barbed wire. Mm. We like to live in a very insular economy. So we live mm. in our own world. Mm. But the reality is, is if we put out information out there, exactly to your point, It's all about execution. I can give you my strategies and my theories about things, but ultimately, if I'm going to be the best FA or the best broker in your life, Mm. then I need that time to nurture the relationship and show you how I'm going to implement and execute the ways to better support you Mm. at both a financial and a health perspective. And I think for me, that's a really good important. We're always scared of having our ideas stolen. Mm. Sign this NDA, Mm. sign this piece of paper. But ultimately, ideas are dime a dozen. It's all about the execution. Exactly. It's all about execution. And also remember that how much information do you come across and everybody listening to this that you don't implement? So it's also this old idea of protecting. So what happens is you spend so much time protecting your IP, you're not actually engaging with new IP. And when you're spending so much time protecting your IP, you're actually telling yourself inadvertently, that I'm not gonna learn anything new. This is all I know forever, so I'm gonna protect it. Rather than saying, well, I'm continuously learning, I'm a student forever, which means that as I learn, I can share, as I grow, I can help the people around me grow. And so I think if you think about Spotify, for example, if you listen to any of the CEO's interviews, right from the beginning, he wanted to give everybody as much access to Spotify as possible, and then because you loved it so much, you wanted to pay him some more money. And he came in with a totally different approach, obviously being Scandinavian, they have a very different approach to the world, And so he really started this process of give as much as you can and allow people to give you money back because they love working with you so much rather than holding everything behind a sort of golden gate and nobody actually even gets access to that. Yeah, I think it's a perfect example when you look at paywalls on news sites. We have access to freemium entertainment and news on a daily basis, whether that be LinkedIn, Twitter, or a host of other free-based news sites. And the fact that once people start holding onto information or corporations start holding onto information, Mm. They actually make themselves much more vulnerable for decimation. Totally. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, we've come to an age where information is ubiquitous. So now how are you charging us for information when it's ubiquitous? What you need to do is look for new ways to add value. And I think the music world, again, I mean, I'm not even a musician, but if you think about the music world, they don't make money from songs anymore. Now they make money from concerts and they make money from super fans that want to book them for private sessions or whatever the case may be. So we also have to evolve with the times. You know, things are ubiquitously available. Think about, this is also another one. Think about how WhatsApp changed the whole telco sector in the world. You know, they have to now add value in a new way. They can't make money off airtime anymore, thank God. You know, now they're a digital transformation partner. So I think we all have to, in our individual capacity, think about how we add value in new ways and stop holding on to old ways and thinking that's the new way in the future. 
What I think is great about some of your content, you'll be in a taxi or an Uber or traveling between your speaking gigs, and you'll be sitting in a car doing a lot of selfie videos just around random thoughts or a collection of structured thoughts that you've had moving from one meeting to the next. I think as brokers and potential FAs or any other kind of audience members that are on the, the stream today, what they can learn from that is they also have travel time. They also have distribution time between one client to the next. So what is the one learning that you've taken from your one client and then verbalizing that to the audience to add additional value? We all have the ability to have this media channel in the palm of our hands. And I think that for me, your LinkedIn videos are a perfect example for the audience of how it doesn't have to be overly perfected. It doesn't have to be overly well lit. It can be something that you shoot into your video. These are some of my thoughts around how to structure X, Y, Z. This is thoughts around my, my will. This is structured thoughts around my future or my children's education. And I think that's how easy it actually is. But the shyness prevents us from just going live. You just said it. I think as South Africans, we suffer from shyness. It's a weird thing because Americans don't. I mean, those guys are making videos about every Tom, Dick and Harry. They've got podcasts. Everybody's got a podcast. In South Africa, we have this weird idea that nobody wants to see what I want to say and what will people think. But you've got to get over that, you know. And I also think we mustn't always think of ourselves as South Africans. We must also think of ourselves as global citizens, you know. And anything that we are learning can help somebody else learn something as well. And what I use those videos for, really, is almost like a journal. It's almost like I'm reflecting back to myself certain things that I've learned so that I can bank those, move them out the way, and now start thinking about new things. And if you think about journaling, or even Feng Shui has a principle that says if you want to bring anything new into your world, you must get rid of the old. And so this is the idea. You've got all these thoughts. In fact, the stats say you have between 60 and 70,000 thoughts a day, and 90% of them are the same thoughts. So we're almost like in repetition. So what my videos do and what journaling does, it gets rid of certain thoughts, it banks them, and now I've got space for new thoughts. And I think that's a nice way to think about it. Also, from a business creative perspective, you never run out of thoughts. You never run out, out of creativity. It's almost like working out at the gym. Yeah. The more you train the creativity, the more mm. creativity your brain produces. That's such a great point because the thing is, is again, people are fearful that they won't have any new ideas. That's the weirdest thing, right? It's like, but think about this. For uh, 200 years in the Industrial Revolution, IP was so important because access to information was so limited. Only the uh, elite had real access to information. Today, everybody's got access to all information. And so we have to also think about that, that in this new world, information and how you think about information, what access you get, how you're growing, is at such an exponential rate that by you sharing it, only what you're doing is helping other people understand it. And in that process, building trust, building networks, and in that process, being able to do business. I love how in your books you always look at anecdotes from the past and mirror that with the future mm. to then look at ways that we will go into tomorrow. Mm. So I think we bumped into each other it was either this latest book or the one just before that mm. where you were looking at I think it was Italy yes. and the per capita church construct that existed. <laughs> was it Italy? Tell us that story because I think it's a fascinating one about the old and the new and where our value systems have kind of evolved. Well I think the, the whole idea around that concept was about the fact that we had such limited access to information inside churches, inside politics, and whatever the case may be. And that's changed. We become access to so much information around us. But I think more importantly to think about is the bigger problem that most people are having is evolving out of the industrial revolution into the quantum age. You know, And this is from my latest book. And we must also remind ourselves that in agricultural times, the most important thing we had as human beings was power and physicality. And then when the steam engine arrived, there was panic because the steam engine was replacing the human in the source of its creativity or physicality. And then we had the Industrial Revolution and it was amazing and what we had to develop in the Industrial Revolution was logical analytical thinking, which is what we still prioritize today. But here comes artificial intelligence and technology and it's replacing our IQ and analytical thinking just like steam engines replaced our physicality and people are in panic again because all of a sudden technology is taking away what I have always done. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And the future is much more about intuition and emotions because it's in that ability for us to become agile, optimistic, and really be ready for anything in the future needs to come from an emotional awareness and intelligence process, you know? And so I think as humans, we need to evolve away from physical, which we have, from mentality, which we are now, into more emotional beings. So we hear politicians bandy the word fourth industrial revolution around. Like, what does that actually mean to the average man and woman, not just in our country, but 
on a global citizen level? So it's a great question. And I think first, before we even talk about the fourth industrial revolution, let's talk about the third industrial revolution, which is weird. Nobody talks about the third <laughs> industrial revolution. <laughs> what happened right? to the third yeah, one? What happened to the third one? Everybody yeah. skipped it, right? Yeah. But there's a guy called Jeremy Rifkin. He's a global economist. And he speaks about the third industrial revolution. And what he says is happening right now is actually the third industrial revolution, not the fourth one yet. The fourth one we're getting to. But the third industrial revolution is telling us that the three pillars that held up capitalism are imploding. And because of the need for hyper-efficiency in capitalism, these three pillars, that have held up capitalism for the longest time are almost eating themselves based on their own efficiency models. So think about communication, which is one of the pillars. It's become free. Uh, we, we've got WhatsApp, we've got Zoom, all these things are almost free. The next will be free transportation. And this is quite easy to understand because you have driverless cars, no engines, um, no oil, no petrol, that sort of thing. The next one is free energy. Thank God in South Africa we have problems with <laughs> we need power. All of it. <laughs> but also remember that Europe is about to have, start having load shedding. They, they've got a seven times hike on their energy prices. China's being having rolling blackouts for years. They can't keep up with demand. So we are moving into a digital age where power becomes replicable, just like photos, music, and education has become. And that's the next phase. But if we really think about the fourth industrial revolution, I think we need to not call it the fourth industrial revolution because it's not industrial <laughs> at all. This it's, is a revolution. <laughs> it's, no, well, it's the first dematerialization revolution that we're going through. And so what's happening is that everything that was industrial is becoming digital. And the thing when things become digital, they become dematerialized, they become thin air, look about photos, music, all these things have become thin air. And when they become thin air, you can replicate them as much as you want. So actually, the fourth industrial revolution is telling us that everything that we once had structures around, factories for, jobs for, is now becoming almost free. And this is, again, a panic for many people. But remember, this happened when the steam engine arrived. Mm. This happened when the internet arrived. This happened when electricity arrived. This, happened, this has happened many, many, many times in our history. So we must also take a eagle's point of view and say, okay, this has happened, we've made it through, because the question I ask my audiences all the time is, who here works in a farm for 16 hours a day? Nobody does. <laughs> who here works in a factory for 12 hours a day? Nobody does. So now we're in offices, but now we need to think the next phase is going to become much more about being nomadic, about being free, about being a creator in your own sort of way. You know, you see the creator economy now is worth $16 billion and growing exponentially. And so this is really the world that we're moving into, and we need to slowly but surely evolve ourselves and elevate ourselves to meet this future and what it needs from us, rather than complaining at the pace at which it's changing. That's why the banks and governments are frightened and petrified of cryptocurrency, yes. DeFi, decentralized finance, because yes. that is a world changer. It destroys any barriers. It destroys where you are based and where your location is. You really can become a nomadic professional anywhere in the world. Last final bit of advice for anyone who wants to dip a toe in their first global citizen experience by picking up their first international client. So I think the most important thing to do is to go and spend some time wherever it is that you want to be doing business in. You know, so I visited Dubai many times before I actually moved there. I spent a lot of time in Bali and I've spent a lot of time in Thailand, in Mexico, and just to sit around and just experience, have chats, meet people, and just go and explore. I think before you think about doing any business, just go and understand the nuances of the culture. Go and understand how the processes there work. Be respectful to those sort of local rules and regulations. And the more you spend time there, the more it becomes easy for you to engage with that world and for you to start seeing opportunities. So my advice is go on an adventure first, an exploration process before you start thinking about business, and then slowly but surely that becomes obvious and why and how you could do business business in those markets. We have a mutual friend, Nick Harry, and he talks yes. about curiosity and the yes. importance thereof. <clears throat> and I think that brings back the lack of ego and bringing more of your humility to the forefront. Exactly like you say, sit down, have a conversation, have a coffee. All the simple soft skills of human to human interaction is now more important than ever. Thank you so much, John. My pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> yes. Hello everybody. Thanks for your time, really appreciate it. John Senai. My goodness, what an interesting interview. And what an interesting worldview. He said a couple of things that certainly resonate with us and struck the correct chord. Uh, first thing he said was that the world is about to become an even stranger place. Well, we have three generation Z creatures living in our home. And <laughs> it doesn't get any stranger than that. So I say, bring it on. He also said that we as human beings are addicted to certainty and that for the most part we inhabit the space of fragile optimism and he's encouraging us to evolve to agile optimism. 
haven't quite got my head around that one yet. You spoke about information being ubiquitous. In other words, it is literally everywhere. And anybody who wants access to it can have that. And as a result of that, intellectual property no longer holds the value that it used to. And he suggests that we revisit the way that we measure success. And it's all about execution now. Not necessarily in intellectual property, but execution. And that is something that we absolutely believe in at ProfMed. He touched on the global citizen, which is obviously all of us as a result of this information highway, evolving to a, a digital nomad. Um, in other words, it's quite simple. People now can literally work, stay all over the world. Guys, the one thing that he did not touch on was the piano. So I feel compelled to do so. Friends, I don't need to remind you about the trying times that we've been through the past number of years in South Africa. I don't need to remind you about the very challenging trading uh, environment that we are currently working in. I mean, you can uh, literally take your pick. However, we have managed to not only uh, enhance our benefits and extend some of our programs, we've been able to do so in a sensible and prudent manner whilst keeping the affordability narrative absolutely focused uh, in front of mind. And that is nothing short of pushing the proverbial grand piano up a flight of stairs. And as you well know, our membership base is made up of professionals and more and more professionals are traveling the globe and working while doing that. And as a result of that, we have extended our international travel benefit to 150 days cover per person per event. I'm very excited about all the work that we've done and I'm now going to hand you over to Ursula who is going to be telling you about our Tums to Tots program. We're excited to enhance our Tums to Tots baby program with the new toddler benefits in January 2023. Already over 700 moms and babies have registered on the Tums to Tots Baby program. We understand the little ones are future professionals and so we at ProfMed support moms, babies and toddlers to reach important milestones. With the Tums to Tots program, we created a solution that gives parents a choice. When a mom registers on the program, we allocate pebbles that are essentially monetary vouchers that can be redeemed in exchange for a gift or service that the mom really wants. For example, a designer swag bag for mom, a gift hamper for baby or toddler, an online CPR course, and much more. Visit our website for more information. Over to you, Justine. Our new Healing at Home benefit gives members the option to receive medical treatment in the comfort of their home. These services will be covered from the risk benefit in the same way as an in-hospital stay. Treatment will be provided with clinical oversight and monitoring, including continuous remote vital signs monitoring, daily virtual visits, an in-person visit by a clinician for the first three days at home, short-term oxygen, medication, wound care, and pathology tests if required. Healing at Home is currently available to members in and around Johannesburg, Pretoria, and the Eastern Cape, and will be extended to other areas during the course of the year. More information is available on the website. Let's hear what Decent has to say. We're excited to add a maternity benefit to the Proactive Plus and Savvy options for young professionals who are planning to start a family. Benefits will include antenatal consultations, 2D scans, visits to a GP or pediatrician, as well as maternity pathology tests. These maternity benefits will be paid from risk and not from the day-to-day -day benefit. To find out more about this benefit, please visit our website. 
A big change that we believe will add real value to members is the restructuring of Proactive to ProSelect. ProSelect will have a non-co-payment hospital network that has been refined to ensure that ProfMet members have access to the best and most efficient hospitals, excluding hospitals that have had poorer outcomes. We have made changes to the Savvy Hospital Network for 2023. Our Savvy members who use this network will benefit from a 10% discounted contribution. Some hospitals have been removed from the network, so we encourage members to review the new list carefully on our website. We'd also like to highlight that the ProSelect network is broader than the Savvy network, giving members a wider choice of hospitals to choose from. So reviewing the lists of both the Savvy and ProSelect networks is important to empower members to choose what suits their needs. We have negotiated preferential rates for specific day procedures that previously would have required in-hospital stays, and instead, members can now recover at home. Not only does this benefit translate into lower hospital costs, but it also means shorter hospital stays that lower the risk of hospital-acquired infections. Our pre-authorization and call centre are available to help members navigate through the process. Guys, don't forget about our PPS wallet. It's um, an independent vehicle, runs alongside your medical aid, and it is designed to uh, fund all those out of, out of uh, benefit expenses. Um, you choose the amount from 300 Rand uh, with increments of 100 Rand a month up to a maximum of 2,000 Rand. Um, and it's available across all options and can use it to pay for co-payments, as I said, out of benefit expenses, over the counter medication, uh, or maybe you are saving for a future planned health expense. The PPS wallet is perfect for that. Right, time now to hand you over to Ruth, who's going to announce our top supporting intermediary for 2021. I'm honored today to recognize our top 2021 ProfMed intermediaries. These top performers have been identified per region by our new business executives and are based on new applications to the scheme received per region. Our commitment as a brand is to always add value. That begins with how we work with our intermediaries our members and our healthcare providers. It's also a key reason why we have changed the way we engage with our intermediaries this year. I have been appointed in this role to nurture our relationship with you, our intermediaries. You ask for more focused support in terms of how frequently we engage with you, the level of support and information available to you and in general, a new approach to helping your clients make the best decisions for their health. We believe we have already made strong strides in this area and encourage you to share any feedback with us that will help us improve your experience even further. Now, without further ado, I'd like to offer a big congratulations and thank you to our national top winners. They are, in first place, Ruan Nell. In second place, Aaron Perelman. And in third place, Davina Lazarus. Our regional winners are Mariska Adam, Lisa Hayden, Kwesi Dreyer, and Tokazani Zondi. Thank you for your focus, dedication, and commitment to ProfMed and all we stand for. We still have three months left of the year, and I, for one, am looking forward to seeing what you will still achieve this year and what our winner board looks like next year. So, congratulations are in order. As thank you very much for your support. We really, really appreciate it. And I hope that you can see that the amount of work that we are putting in is going to serve our collective members. I'd like to conclude with a rhetorical question asked by the late Freddie Mercury. Can you do the Fandango?
Well, yes, we can. We have been doing that for many, many years, and we will continue to ensure that we keep pushing that grand piano up that flight of stairs. Thank you very much. Prof Med Mind and Field is a documentary series that chronicles the story of the professional behind the professional. Two of those characters are multi-Paralympic medalist Luzanne Kutsier and her guide Klaus Kempen. I sat down with them recently to learn about all of Luzanne's exploits and what her plans are for Paris 2024. Luzon, Klaus, so lovely to have you with me in studio today. We're going to kick straight off with it. Luzon, tell us, how does the professional relationship work between you and Klaus? And, and how does Klaus fit into the whole mix? Klaus is my guide runner, so he does my longer distance running with me. Um, and we compete together in anything from a 10 kilometers up to a marathon. We want to start doing a bit of the shorter stuff just for him for experience. Um, he and I train together three to six times a week, depending on the time of year. And he is a trusted friend as well as a guiding partner for me. I think that's great around the trust. So tell us more about how that partnership works. How long have you been running together uh, as a duo? And when you're in competitions, like how does that relationship work? We've been running now together for eight years. Um, and how we run together is through what we call a tether. So a tether is a, a band that holds the two athletes together with a handle on each side. And then you hold on to that handle. And during competitions, basically Klaus is my eyes. He explains to me the route and he explains to me the surroundings. And he also like, tells me where we are in the race, where we are placed. And he's just a great motivator for me to keep pushing and keep moving forward. Klaus, you guys are the two stars of our Mind and Field series that's on Supersport and also for our viewers they can watch on Prof Med's YouTube channel. So I want to know more about that experience, Mind and Field, the value that you add both as you as the guide and, and Luzon as the runner and how does this work? How do you bring all of these different elements of your career, your insights and your actual athleticism into the mix? Sure, Mike. It's a it's, it's such a privilege to be part of this and actually only after watching the, the documentary uh, we realized that what the impact is because for us it has become uh, a day-to-day -day thing. It has become something that, that's just natural. Um, and I think the, the wonderful thing is in hindsight we can look at a lot of these things and like Luzon said we train together, uh, we see each other five, six times a week but not all of it is just fun. There's some debates and there's a lot of laughs and all of that but when it comes together it's, it's, it's brilliant um, and, and, and that, what, that, what, that, that makes it worthwhile um, making sure that you make time between your work, between family um, and all of those things um, to, to, to make that, that mix and that, that thing, that gummy berry juice. No, that's incredible. I think that's a, great, that's a great line, the gummy berry juice. But I think, Luzon, I think what we really touch on in the series is that so many times when we see athletes or we see professional sports stories, we see the athlete. We don't necessarily see the professional and team of professionals behind them. Like you, your, your team is there with you all the time. And then there's obviously a whole bunch of other elements and, and ingredients that go into that. So talk to us about the importance of the professional relationship behind you as the professional athlete? Being somebody with a disability, I was born blind. It's really, throughout my life, my whole support system has been a huge team behind me, from occupational therapists up to coaches, up to um, lecturers when I studied at university. Um, so I can really say having a disability has forced me to, and I'm very happy about it, has forced me to sort of utilize teams and you, you know use trust and, and to trust people. And I think, as you say, you know, a lot of people don't realize what goes into an athlete. You just see the end result and you see that 10 seconds or that four minutes or that two hours that you, you see when, you, when the athlete is competing. But there's, there's years of practice, years of teamwork, years of, you know, getting up when you don't feel like going to training, people working out your programs, people supporting you, people being with you through bad times and people, you know, your family and friends going through you, going with you through injuries and maybe some disappointments. There's a massive team behind all, behind all professional athletes. And I think 
I'm just very thankful that I have had this team and that we can now also call ProfMed a part of our team um, and and part of our our success story. And it's it's just having a team and embracing that team is amazing. And and once you once you embrace your team, you become such a happy and whole person. It's it's really amazing. We've had some chats in the past over the last six months that we've got to 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 know each other. And Klaus, I, I think you frame it really nicely talking about the stuff that Luzon teaches you on a daily basis. Can you just give me like a little overview of that? Because I think you 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 encapsulated so beautifully how that how that what she teaches you and vice versa. Yeah, I, I think sometimes she thinks I'm a little kid because she wants to teach me about everything. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> luckily, I just can pretend I listen. But no, she teaches me so much about um, not being a victim. Um, so, and, and, and I'm saying that in the sense that I can, I can get frustrated at work and, and I go and I, tell, I talk to her and I, I share immediately. And then just afterwards reflecting a little bit, it just comes that whether you're blind or whether you're having a bad day, your girlfriend left you, your parents are sick or whatever, being a victim is a choice. Um, it's, it's, and, and she helps me to show that she could overcome it, so I can, can, can overcome my little difficulties, even though it's a reality and a big thing for me as well. And, and maybe I just want to say in the fact that the previous question you asked her about being part of a team, the great thing is, is that Luzon is the face of the team. She, she is the team. Um, and the fact for me to sit here is, is wonderful because that sh that's a successful team. It's as soon as she, and it's only because of her, she brought us forward and, and the rest of us, uh, our coaches, everybody. She gave us a platform to work on. But you have to be willing to be part of the team from the backside um, and support there. And then you get all these wonderful exposures and, and, and partnerships and everything. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege to buy into somebody's dream and, 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 uh, and potential. Absolutely inspiring stuff. Thank you so much for both of you for joining me. And on behalf of the entire ProfMed team and everybody associated, we are backing you. We are on the path to Paris 2024. What an amazing partnership, Luzon and Klaus. Um, the success is tremendous. At ProfMed, we often feel that in some small way, we are a little bit of the professional supporting your success um, in your business interests. We know and we've learnt over time that healthcare and your own health is the biggest contributor to your financial success into the future. And so we play this small part in terms of helping you and helping your families. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about stretching our service and how our service in itself is ProfMed's main differentiator. So if you are comparing us to other schemes, the service is what you often only feel once you experience it. I'm going to talk a little bit through a few of the key service areas. The main one when a member needs ProfMed is certainly our call center. So we have, and we've designed it that way, that we have graduates in the call center. So these graduates can relate better to our members. The graduates are of a higher caliber in terms of answering questions. We have almost a 90% first time resolution rate, which means the first time you call, we're going to answer it and we're going to help you out. We also measure every call that comes in, every query that comes in. It doesn't matter what it is, we measure it from the time it starts, we voice record that, and we have people actually looking into the call after the fact so that we can constantly improve how we service you as a member. Our rates are above the rest of the industry. So we answer almost 90% of the calls within the first 30 seconds. There are some places or some times of the week, like a Monday morning, where everybody phones and you might find that your waiting time is a little bit longer. But on average, we answer those calls quickly and proficiently. We have over 2022 specifically spent time in looking at what about the more difficult calls? What about the more complex calls? What about if you need a motivation from a doctor and whether you need an authorization? Um, is there hurdles that, that you maybe don't understand that you need information on? And so we've equipped the call center to respond upfront to those hurdles, make sure you're well informed about what your cover is. We've also built an escalations team 
that looks at the root causes of why people need to phone again. Why was it not resolved the first time? And so that team's been in place since earlier this year and you would have experienced an improvement overall in terms of even those very complex matters. We know medical schemes are complex. We know that you need somebody to navigate your pathway through the healthcare experience. And so we have these people available to you and you will see through the website, we have many members who actually share compliments, uh, provide us with feedback in terms of where they've experienced really good support from our team. A lot of it is around the new business team that helps them become a member. Some of it is around even our disease management group, which helps you when you have a chronic condition and you need to understand what is covered in terms of that chronic condition. We have a coach that sits there and walks you through the steps in terms of what you would experience and how you can improve your health care in dealing with this chronic condition. And so please look at that website and uh, see what they are saying. We also receive a few complaints and we look at those carefully and we make sure that we change in processes and we reinforming and training our staff to respond to those complaints. Healthcare is a dynamic space changing rapidly and so as we look at 2023, we see some of the same changes that we've been debating and talking about over the last few years come to fruition. We certainly see the pressure on affordability coming through. But key and top of mind is the national health insurance debate. And in this debate where we see um, Health Portfolio Committee actually meeting and reviewing the legislation, we also realize that the Department of Health has employed people in the service already. The concern from a ProfMed perspective is the amount of power that sits within the Department of Health space in controlling what is anticipated as a 500 billion rand budget a year. So this dwarfs other projects that the government has taken on over the last few years. And to see health as a priority is going to be difficult to spend so much money on national health insurance. So the biggest gap we see is the funding of national health insurance. And along with that funding, how do we make sure that the funding is spent correctly and that it really does enhance and improve the lives of South Africans in general? The national health debate has not yet covered crucial aspects of the National Health Bill, and that is aspects relating to benefit design and what it costs to actually fund those type of benefits. And so we are awaiting the detail of that, but again, we look at quite a significant high funding requirement for national health insurance. We need to be part of the debate and not just oppose everything. And so as we support the conversations, we've also noted the fact that there are other national health regulations that have been in place for many years. In fact, the one case that has come through at the start of this year is the Certificate of Need, which is part of the National Health Act since 2009. And so earlier the year, we've seen a court case which indicated that the certificate of need was not constitutional. And so we see specifically in the court case, it indicates to us that people must be able to exercise their profession wherever they can. And also it indicates that people must be able to gain health wherever they can. So they must be able to access healthcare service where they choose. And so it has a direct implication on national health insurance. Now this does mean that there will be constitutional challenges when it comes to the implementation of national health insurance. And as I mentioned earlier, we do anticipate the bill to actually go through Parliament, but we will look carefully at what those constitutional challenges are. I know everybody has been talking about the scheme that um, really has struggled and Health Squared um, has been a scheme that really has struggled in a few aspects. And we looked to what we could learn from a ProfMed perspective from the Health Squared case. I certainly had members of my family phoning and saying, how do I get onto another scheme and how do I do that quickly to access healthcare services? And perhaps you've had a similar case. So what we learned from the Health Squared experience is firstly that a deteriorating membership often leads to a real threat on the sustainability of the scheme. And so you'll see three graphs in front of you. The first one really is the membership graph. Health Squared was the amalgamation of two schemes who got together to try and make sure they could get scale into the market. In fact, that didn't work because we see over time from 2010 to now that the membership has declined quite quickly. With the decline in membership, what you often find is that on this right hand side, the, the age of the membership of a scheme 
also deteriorate. So the higher an age of a scheme, the higher the contributions will be. And we see Health Squared move from um, a 12% pensioner rate in, in 2010 all the way through to now where it almost sits with a 30% pensioner rate. So with that happening, it does mean that contributions have to respond. And contributions obviously drive more members away. And then the last fundamental point, which is the solvency of the scheme, we'll see, we see the deterioration actually come off from 2014 all the way down to now, where we see health squared solvency sit below and in and around 2%. That is a result of the drop in membership, the higher aging of the scheme, and then the financials tend to do that. And so this has been on the cards for some time. The solvency ratio is legislated at 25%. And if you're below the 25%, the scheme is considered to be in trouble. And there is financial repercussions from the regulator. And certainly the Board of Trustees will fight to try to keep the scheme sustainable. So what we are seeing is from 2010, the solvency decline all the way through to almost 2%. And so we learn some really important lessons around how to manage the scheme and what not to do. So I'm going to show how these principles apply to ProfMed. So the first thing I'm showing you here is the publicly available and published information in terms of membership of the schemes for 2021. ProfMed being the black graph right on the end, we grew by 2% and ProfMed has a history of growing over time. Uh, BestMed 3% and you'll see throughout the industry differing um, successes, a momentum zero, discovery zeros, um, and we'll see right on the end, the open schemes in fact actually lost 2% of, of membership. It does pose an industry question on how sustainable the industry is if we have a loss in membership because we aren't bringing the young people in. But ProfMed's own story, and if you look at the key insights for ProfMed, the black graph shows you the net growth rate per year, and you'll see consistently for the last at 10 years, we've grown between 2 and 6%. The rest of the industry, the dotted line below, has struggled and grown, but at a lesser extent to profit. So we've actually done exceptionally well, and it is because of the success that some of our brokers have experienced as well. So thank you for your support as we've made this a successful scheme. Comparing it to a few of our closest competitors, a discovery and momentum, you'll see different um, successes throughout the last few years. And so I think if the message, if you look at the graphs and you get the message carefully, it is that we are consistent in terms of our approach. We grow consistently, even in the challenging times, we've had some growth. We look at the next year or two and we anticipate a very flat view of membership growth. Another graph just showing you the rest of the industry, you'll see big gains and, and some big losses as well throughout the industry. So let's look at ProfMed again, and I'm referencing the age part, the other fundamental is the age part. In fact, the ProfMed's age is quite high when you consider the rest of the industry, but it has been consistent. The other schemes have got some up and down in terms of, and that's driven by the membership changes on those schemes. From 2018, ProfMed has in fact got a little bit younger. Other schemes have aged. And so what happens is for every year your scheme ages, it adds 3% to your premiums across the whole scheme. And so we have focused specifically on trying to get the age group managed and attract the young and healthy individuals and make sure the young professionals as they leave universities are coming into ProfMed as part of our strategy. This is a solvency um, graph, so it's actually looking at how healthy financially the scheme is. And you'll see ProfMed sitting on 41%. The others sitting somewhere between 38 and, and 57%. We have seen schemes benefit from the COVID experience. It seems counterintuitive, but many members didn't go and access those very large hospital procedures during COVID. And so we see a little bit of an uptick in the last two years on many of the, of the schemes. And what is happening now is we see those reserves being given back to the members um, in the 2023 and 2024 20, years as well. And you'll see it as I share with you the contributions experience and the contributions and our premium increases for 2023. So now all of you immediately are going to look at the ProfMed's average increase on, on that side. It is 9.64%. This year we started our roadshow a little bit later than normal and so we've had the opportunity to consider where the other schemes have actually gone. So you'll see MedShield coming in at 6.7%. It's actually quite low. All the way through Fed, Fed Health 8.8%. In fact, the one that we looked at carefully was the discovery increase. 
and Discovery actually announced that it would be CPI plus three or four percent. So CPI being somewhere between seven and seven and a half at the moment, it's going to be between 11 and 12 percent next year. So our average increase, even while we've improved many of the benefits, is a reasonable 9.64 percent. When we look at the individual plans and much of the detail you receive in your brochures will be available also on the website. But let's just reflect on the individual plan. So here we have the Pro Select plan. For many of you on this scheme, you would understand it's actually the old proactive plan. We've refined the hospitals you can choose from and we've excluded the net care group from this, from this option. So please, if you do usually get your hospitalization and consultations done with a specialist who works in those net care hospitals, please reconsider whether this is the right plan for you. Um, you'll see the increases here. So the average increase on this plan is 8.9% and you'll see for an adult dependent um, 168 to 189 Rand. For a child 76 Rand is the maximum you're going to pay per month to add a child. So look at the actual premium as well as these are the Rand increases that I'm talking to but it's less than the price of a movie ticket um, in terms of the increase. This is our value plan. This is where if you are struggling with affordability consider carefully moving to this plan um, and perhaps supplementing it with the PPS wallet that Hendrix spoke of a little bit earlier. So our Proactive Plus plan has really been boosted by the additional benefits of maternity and you've heard that earlier as well. So look carefully, if you are starting a family and you have a young family, this is the plan you really want to belong to because it offers a small day-to-day -day benefit but offers you comprehensive hospitalization. If you are moving to the PLUS plan, you'll also see the difference is that we pay 200% in terms of hospital and other associated costs. And the increase there is 9.9%, um, 225 to 250 for a main member and for a child 88 to 98 Rand. This is the Rand increase, please, it's not the premium. So the next plan is really designed around an established family, a family that needs a little bit more day-to-day -day cover, and it is one of the more comprehensive options in the marketplace. This does take a 9.9% increase in contributions, and you'll see the increase in the RAND values for an adult and child, similar to the other plans we've presented. If we move to the most comprehensive plan, this is the plan that offers really good comprehensive day-to-day -day cover, plus it covers some of those unique benefits that many of the schemes don't offer. These are biologic benefits and typically we see with the advancement of healthcare technology, we see new biologics emerge every year. And it does mean that on this plan, if you need a biologic, you can get access to it. 80% of that cost will be covered. We have a handful of members who utilize biologics and effectively we spend almost 300,000 Rand a month on these individuals. And so people aren't always aware of the high cost of healthcare. But on this plan, you are going to receive the cover that you require. The increase on this plan is 12.9%. So it is higher than the rest because this plan has operated historically at deficits or at losses in the past. And so we see many people who need the cover buying up to this plan only when they need the cover. But it is by far the most comprehensive option in the marketplace. The increases are above a thousand rand and you need to look at it carefully. But if you want peace of mind and you want the right cover, this is the right plan for you. Thank you for hearing us today. We look forward to seeing how our benefits land with your members. We really appreciate all the support that we receive from the brokers. Uh, certainly the new business team does a marvelous job, but we wish you all the best for 2023. Thanks so much, Craig. Next up, I'm going to sit with Craig and with Hendrik as we go through those questions that you've provided in the comment section of today's stream. Whenever we come to this part of the roadshow, I always feel like we're on a game show. It's time to interrogate my attendees here and see if they can answer the million dollar questions. Um, first off, I wanna start off about becoming a professional nomad. I've listened to John's interview, we've gone into a lot of territory with him and I'm really excited to be a global citizen. And for me, what I really like about one of the products that I've read up from a ProfMed perspective is that you have a sabbatical and an international 
cover or have a break. Uh, I'm interested in this because I want to be able to jump across various seas and go to various parts of the world. So Hendrik, let's start with you. Let's talk specifically to sabbatical and international cover. How does that work? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, we have spent much time understanding um, purchasing behavior, uh, the way different uh, demographic groups within our membership base, existing and future, see things, understand things. And um, yeah, off the back of what John Senai said is that uh, many, many of our professionals are moving abroad. Sabbaticals, uh, ProfMed is the only uh, fund, by the way, that um, a sabbatical benefit is activated up front, um, the member is suspended in the right way. <laughs> they can go overseas, abroad, study, further their careers for three years. Obviously, they have to be on ProfMed uh, for one year before they can activate the sabbatical benefit and come back with zero underwriting. We accept them. Obviously, the key being they have to activate the sabbatical benefit. Um, the international travel cover is something that we are very, very happy to do because, again, in line with um, the evolution of the global citizen in, into the nomad, professional nomad, is uh, again, more and more of our members are moving abroad, working from there, coming back. And so the 150 days just makes, makes uh, so much sense to us. So we are doing everything that we can to, to support this, this evolution, this move, if you will, into the future. Fantastic. Craig, we talk at length uh, off air about the NHI, so I'd like to throw the first question about the NHI to you, please. Uh, when will NHI be in a position or in a form that will have an effect on healthcare funders? Yeah, I think in general the NHI has been debated since 2007. It's taken us 15 years to get to this point where the, where the bill is in front of Parliament, and so we do anticipate that bill being approved. But implementation is actually a phased approach. We've heard from the Director General quite clearly that it's going to be a long-term uh, goal before final NHI is actually realized. The big hurdle that we still see is we still haven't um, seen a document that says these are the benefits within an NHI. This is how the funding is going to work. And so I mentioned it earlier, but unless you have uh, a budget and unless you know what you're actually providing, um, we probably need to go through another set of debates and understand how NHR will actually change our lives. It has to change healthcare as we see it now. So the change we must anticipate, but it is going to be a more gradual change than I think we thought two or three years ago. Mm. And I think it's all about those granular details, like you say. You want to see the, the actual minutia of what is being proposed. Um, this is our third time presenting from this set, but fortunately we can go outside, we can engage with our friends and families, and I think I have to ask the question about COVID. Um, are we done with it? And what is the ProfMed strategy to prepare for any potential changes? COVID was a different dynamic for us, and, and certainly we didn't, we didn't see um, anything like it before. So the structure of a medical scheme is such that we hold a specific amount of reserves in place. So um, we have currently just over 37% of reserves available, but it really is a safety net. So if we see pandemics into the future that might not just be labeled COVID, we are prepared for that type of things to make sure that ProfMed remains sustainable and that we can actually pay for the cover that members need. So um, COVID in, in its own sense, I think, is still a risk. Mm. So we have to keep on watching it. We monitor it regularly. Um, we watch what the numbers are. In the last six months, we've seen very little COVID experience, especially in hospital where we saw 2020, 2021, we had one case that cost us over 10 million rand and that was a COVID related case. Um, we haven't seen any real hospitalization relating to COVID for the last six months, which is a good indication that I think it started to settle, but we still wary about it. We'll watch the risk and how it unfolds. I think people must still make sure that they've been vaccinated, do everything they can to, uh, to avoid getting COVID. The other part of COVID that we are also very cognizant of is this term long-term COVID. So mm. it's the repercussions of maybe you've had COVID um, and the other ailments and, and conditions that you now um, have for the long term. And so we're watching that quite closely in terms of our membership that we've got the scheme. And so we fight very, very closely to look at five and 10 year projections of sustainability for ProfMed. And then in terms of 
medical advancement and, and technological advancements. We hear people talking about us, you know, we're living in the future now. I think maybe I'm going to throw this one over to you, Hendrik. Like, what kind of technological advancements are you excited about? What do you think will be the game changers of the, the, the future present in terms of uh, medical advancements? Great question. Um, I think I'll answer that in two parts. The first part will be just the the um, advancement on the, in the field of, of biological drugs, um, specifically relating to cancer cancer treatments, because we all know that um, the, the the previous uh, set of drugs was very destructive to, to the human body. So it kills the cancer, but it also kills cells similar to your own, and they grow. Um, the medication that your body requires, specifically the cancer that you have, and, uh, and they give it back to you. And that's, that's, I'm very, very excited about that. And then also, with regards to non-invasive surgeries, um, there are all manner of um, surgery robotics, mm -hmm. where the surgeon could sit in California, as an example, and perform uh, a you know, very delicate surgery, someone, a patient, maybe somewhere in Africa. So obviously your infection rate goes down, um, the, the procedures can be done at, at, a, at, a, at a far more exact level, and the outcomes are, are far better. The, the challenge, however, is that a lot of these um, developments happen overseas, and for us to bring them into Africa and employ them costs a lot of money. I just want to touch again on, on the point that Craig was, was making about NHI, and it's a financial point. Uh, nobody is arguing that NHI is very, very important. What we are saying is that the financial premise of which budgets were calculated was, was incorrect because, guys, healthcare funding done properly is very, very expensive. It is indeed. I have two more questions for today's session. The first one is, will the increase be implemented with effect 010123, and when does upgrade close this year? Yeah, two very good questions. So upgrade closes near the end of December, so please, I think it is the 16th of December, please make sure yeah. that your option changes are in by then. Um, in terms of uh, the deferred increases we've seen industry-wide, and we actually explain the at-home care benefit again. Is it considered as an alternative to hospital care and therefore covered where hospital benefits apply? It absolutely is a home benefit. We call in it healing at home. Uh, it does replace many hospital events. It doesn't replace all of them. And it's a team uh, manner of addressing those, those type of events. So we're asking doctors to work with our teams to get the right diagnostic equipment. Uh, we've got to support uh, a group that will support us. But that equipment sits at home. I think during COVID, many people felt safer at home than they did in, in the facilities. And so the, the way that technology has actually moved allows us to support people in their own homes, which means they usually recover a little bit better. Um, and it's familiar cir circumstances, etc. So we really think that that's going to be a, a, a great benefit for members to experience. But it will be based on the doctor's agreement and the members willing to, to have received the treatment at home. And one final part of that snuck in here. When is it coming to Cape Town? You know, we need to make sure we have the right groupings of providers, doctors, specialists, mm. and, and nurses available to ensure that you're safe to have healing done at home. And so we're looking for that, for that type of grouping. I'm sure it's going to happen in the coming year. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. And thank you to all of our guests and all of our experts and all of our team members that have joined us today. Thank you to so many of you, the thousand odd of you who have tuned in today. For those of you who have missed any of the content, you can go to profmed.coza and you can find more information and access to the streams thereof. Also, based on the request to have those clips from John Sanai and Luzon and Klaus once again reflighted on our YouTube channel, check out ProfMed YouTube channel where you'll be able to see those interviews in full. Any other questions, send us through on social channels. We are looking forward to any other questions, comments that you may have. Thank you so much for joining us on Roadshow 2022. Hope you have a fantastic festive season with your loved ones and we'll be here online all the time. Thank you very much.
Today, we write the world of tomorrow. Leveraging 60 years of experience while spearheading the new. A delicate dance of wisdom and foresight, we are paving and pioneering the road that lies ahead. Sharing a vision, an entrepreneurial spirit and solutionist way of life. Our purpose is defined in the professionals we serve, an intelligent partner when you need us most. Investing time to design, build and create value. We meet at the intersection of innovation and science, creativity and analytics. Together, we are that collective of professionals who dream, who challenge the norms and achieve the extraordinary. So let's keep leading the way expanding our journey, lighting the path, with the peace of mind that your well-being is covered by a professional just like you, who shares your values, your investment and your commitment to deliver every day with Tomorrow Imagined. We are ProfMed, intelligent medical aid for professionals. Thank you.